Thank you. I'm a little bit short, so I'm going to go up there and take this with me. I didn't mean this, I mean the whole thing. Thank you, Pastor Nathan. Awesome. Thank you. There you go. That's better, I think. Just give me a few seconds till I organize this. I think that might be better, Nathan. I'll get this here. All right, that's good. Thank you. Grab the city gates and take them to the top of the hill for us. <laughs> <laughs> that too, yeah. Awesome. Uh, I think this may be a bit too loud, yeah? You want to bring the volume down a little bit? Thank you. Fantastic. Look, I can't, I can't help say this over and over again, that you are blessed, all right, to have pastors such as this that have stepped out, uh, not just in faith, right, because that's, that's a given. It's, faith is there, obviously, but it also takes courage to act in faith. Because faith without works is what? Dead, right? And so incredible courage to step out and to put on this conference. And like I said last night, uh, it's um, last morning, it's world class. Honestly, I'm not patronizing, you know, Pastor Nathan or anyone. I'm saying it's world class. You've got incredible stuff. Uh, I mean, if you look at, you know, the, the quality of the ministry, if you look at what Pastor Dan brought and he's bringing, I mean, powerful, right? Uh, Pastor Tim and this short brown guy here. What's his name? Lester. Sorry, Cammy. Okay. What? What? Why are you laughing? Why, why are you laughing? At least I didn't talk in a pretend Indian yeah. accent. And, and if you look at it, right, I mean, Pastor Nathan didn't tell me, I'm sure he didn't tell you or Pastor Tim, what, you know, topics to speak on. And all he said was, look, you know, kingdom come. And I love it. I love the fact that, you know, you got a kingdom mindset. I mean, Jesus said, I'll build my church, and there's nothing wrong there. So you can, you know, partner with him to build the church, but he's about the kingdom, right? And when you talk about kingdom, if you look at that, I'm just playing with semantics, right? If you look at king, stroke, domination, all right? And so I think it was Pastor Dan that spoke about, uh, you know, Genesis chapter 1 and how uh, the Lord said, you know, he blessed man and said, have dominion. And so that's, that's powerful. So you, you are in an incredible spiritual space in this nation. You know, I'll go as far as saying this. And I may be wrong, I may be right. I don't really care right now. But I'm saying to you, the world needs to have leaders and not believers in Jesus. Because even the devil believes in Jesus, right? But followers of Jesus. Big difference that are committed to see his kingdom come. That's what we need. Because the battle is not between you and I or you know, that organization and this. Like from the very beginning, it's about kingdom. The kingdom of darkness and the kingdom of light. The kingdom of God and the kingdom of Satan. Come on. And so talk about the great commission. Jesus said, go make disciples of all nations. That's a battle. That's kingdom. And so this is powerful. This is really, really powerful. So you're doing a great work. I mean, all of you, a fantastic work. Well done. All right. I just said that to make you feel good. No, 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 no. So I'm going to make a st yeah. I'm going to make a statement. And you remember what I said on the first day, the first morning? I said many things, but one of the key things I said was, in terms of, you know, revelation and living in the experience of yesterday's revelation, you cap yourself, you put a ceiling. And so God constantly wants us to lift our spiritual altitude and fly beyond the cloud, right? So whatever that cloud is, I'm not talking about the dark cloud, I'm talking about, you know, revelation and experience. 
uh, that we receive and live in, we need to go beyond that. And with that, I said that whatever you do not confront in your life, you conform to. Now, if I was you, I'll write that down and I'll read it over and over and over and over again. I'll tell you why. I'm not sure about you, but we take experiences for granted. It's human nature, all right? It's human nature where we conform and there's nothing wrong in conforming to something good, something God, all right? But whatever we conform to becomes our limit. And so if you don't challenge what conforms you, there can never be transformation. Don't kid yourself. Don't kid yourself. I mean, look at Jesus, right? Jesus shows up, not shows up, you know what I'm saying, right? He just bang on the planet, gets what he does. He confronts. He confronts religiosity. He confronts tradition. He confronts the old. He confronts that which the Jewish people had up to that time conformed to. Come on, somebody. Was it bad? It wasn't. But God always has something better. I mean, the book of Hebrews is about something better, a better covenant, a better way. And so in doing, if you want to step into the better, you need to confront what is. Because if you don't, you'll conform to it. Yeah? And so that's why you need to expose yourself in a healthy environment to have your thinking confronted. Hello? Guess what Jesus did? I, I love miracles, right? But there's also a space there where you need to read the Gospels and go, for example, what did Jesus confront? He confronted not just a system, he confronted the thinking that created the system. I'll say it again. He didn't just confront the Jewish traditional system. He didn't confront that. He confronted the thinking because our conformity is in our thinking. And that's why Paul says to us, in Romans 12 and verse 2, be transformed by the, come on somebody, the renewing of your mind. And so the thinking, stinking thinking, you've heard that phrase before, right? So you've got to confront stinking thinking. And even if the stink, thinking is not stinking, if it's capping you, if it's limiting you, you need to confront it. There's no growth without confrontation. Now look, when you confront, there's pain. Come on, somebody. There's pain. Especially when my thinking is confronted. You heard the saying, right? He is set in his ways or she is set in her ways. Well, guess what that actually means? Set in my ways or your ways or, you know, the reference of it is talking about set, a mind that is set, mindset, a thinking pattern, a process, a mindset that is set just in one direction and cannot observe the same thing from a different perspective. You are just set in that and that becomes your truth. There are certain truths, I think it was Pastor Tim that said, certain fundamental truths of, you know, the word of God that never change, right? So I'm not talking about that, obviously. We are talking to leaders here. So you understand that, right? But I'm talking about a thinking that creates a system that was useful at one point, but it's not useful right now. In fact, it limits the progress of the kingdom of God. It limits the growth of the church. It limits your growth as a leader. And so when you talk about the emotionally fit leader, this is what it's about. At least a part of what it's about the confrontation of a thinking pattern, the confrontation of a mindset that is creating that barrier, that's creating that limit. So, having said that, I'm going to read a statement to you, which I wrote down this morning. It's a part of, you know, what I, 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 I do with workshops, but I wanted to say it exactly as it was, so I wrote it down. You ready for this? Now, this statement, I assure you, will challenge some of your thinking. It will confront 
something in your mind that you have conformed to. And I love doing it. Here you go. Here you go. The quality of your life is influenced by the quality of your experiences. I said again, the quality of your life is influenced, you can use the word shaped or formed also, by the quality of your experiences. Now all I want you to do is just think. Pause for a moment and think. Think. There's nothing right or wrong about it, good or bad about it. It's a statement that confronts something that is right now. Not necessarily something that is evil, okay? But something in your space, in your mind, that perhaps you need to think about. The quality, the quality. I, you say 97% of the work I do with this is in the corporate world. People that don't know the Lord. And the rest is within church. So, you know, this context here. And so ever so often, when I say, make that statement, I ask, what do you think? And I'm not going to do it here. I don't want to embarrass anyone. Hands would go up and go, well, what about Jesus? Doesn't he give me the quality of my life? Now, if you want to go that direction, I will. But I'll make it easy for you. It is easy to just make that statement, Jesus is the one that gives me the quality of life I have. It's easy. In fact, it's more than easy. It's a given. But how many of you realize that the day you receive Christ in your heart, it was a historic event, right? It had to do with your eternity. It's so significant. I don't have words to describe it. But here's a question. Did your life change in an instant? Did that drunkard husband get converted the following day? I mean, miracles happen. I'm not saying that, but in general, all right. Did that growth that you have on your right breast disappear? Perhaps it did. But that's not the norm, is it? Come on, somebody. And so it's easy to parrot Christianese because we pick language, right? That's a different topic altogether. But the power of language, my friend, maybe on another day we'll talk about that. We'll investigate that. The power of language, because like, like, like Jesus said, whatever we have in our hearts, our mouth speaks, right? So another word, because if you look at the Aramaic, the word for heart and soul, for mind, is used interchangeably. And so whatever a man thinks in the Old Testament, right? Book of Proverbs, whatever a man thinks, so is he. And so it's not and I'm going to say this because we are talking to leaders here in some form or the other you're a leader that's why you're here right so it's not good enough to say well I believe in Jesus I'm looking for the evidence of your belief in Jesus in a transforming lifestyle in a life that is constantly transforming because the ultimate goal, my friend, according to what Paul taught us in the book of Corinthians, the ultimate goal of every human being is to be like Jesus. Because that's what we lost. You know, Pastor Dan, brilliant last morning about being created in the likeness of God. My Lord. Jack, have you ever thought of that? And what we lost after the fall is not that likeness because it's still there. But it's covered, it's tainted by sin. It's contaminated. But when we receive salvation in our spirit, boom, the spirit man, that image, it's like a, it's like a what do you call it? A lamp. The thing that you have at the top? A lamp. Uh, uh, a lantern. What do you call the? Yeah, a lampshade. You know, you go camping and you light the thing and wow, that was deep revelation. <laughs> So there's suit, right? There's suit. And so what happens when the light of salvation is lit, you know, the spirit man is boom, brought alive, all the suit goes. 
But then because we rock and roll in life, you know, the issues in life, blah, 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 we get a bit sooty again, right? And so that's why we have the presence of Holy Spirit within us that keeps us being transformed into the likeness of Jesus. So transformation, the ultimate goal of transformation is to be like Jesus. And that's what Paul says, right? 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18, that we have been daily transformed into his likeness. In the book of 1 Thessalonians, he says, when we see him, we'll be like him. Ultimate, boom. I don't care about walking in the streets of gold, mate. You see, if you're looking to go to heaven, to walk in the streets of gold, uh, come on, lift your game. If you want to walk the streets of gold, go to Dubai. How much have you been to Dubai? <laughs> I mean, it's not gold, but literally, they're like, you know, four, five hundred meters, if not more, on both sides of the street, gold. I'm talking about gold, pure gold, from 18 to 22 carat, 24 carat, gold made. So you want to see gold, just take a trip to Dubai. It'll be cheaper. You will not be disappointed when you get to heaven. You see, when I get to heaven, my, I mean, come on, right? All the smackings I've got from life, the bruises, the crushing, the, you know, the crying, the bleeding, the sweating, the fighting, is not to walk on streets of gold. Give me a break. Come on. So what am I talking about? Mindset. You see, it's to hear the voice of my master saying, hey, Cammy, or oh, he may call me Lester, don't you dare. <laughs> well done, my good and faithful servant. That's all I want to hear. And when I arrive there, boom, I am like him. When I look at him, I'm not seeing Cammy, I'm seeing Jesus. Come on. When he looks at me, he's not seeing this crazy person. He's seeing himself. I am a reflection of him in his eyes. That's the ultimate, my friend. And so that's why we need to understand this, that the quality of our life is influenced by the quality of our experiences. Now here's something else for you. When it comes to our experiences, the quality of our experience is determined by the quality of our relationships. Whoa, put that, I was going to say put it in a pipe and smoke, but I don't encourage you to do that. But think of it, right? I'll say that again. The quality of your experiences is determined by the quality of your relationships. Three relationships. Again, because, you know, this is a Christian context. So we're talking about experience, right? I said earlier, I'll, I'll just try and I'll, I'll put it together. The quality of your life and mine is influenced by the quality of our experience. Think of that word experience. We experience life together. We experience life, you know, as a family experience. Life is full of experiences, the good, the bad, the ugly. So the quality of those experiences is what gives us the quality of the life we have. Now, I'll, I'll, I'll marry the next statement to that. The quality of your experiences is determined by the quality of your relationships. What relationships? Three types of relationships. Number one, your relationship with God. You see, the quality of your life is fundamentally, essentially, as a born-again follower of Jesus, determined by the quality of your relationship with him. I mean, again, go back. If you're looking for theology, go back to the beginning, right? God's plan of salvation was there even before the fall. The Genesis 3.15 is a revelation. Of, you know how he says about the seed of the woman and all that stuff? His plan was already there. So man, the, the, the fall of man essentially is his separation from God. Yeah? And so Jesus came, died on the cross of Calvary, and he adopted us as sons again. The ultimate in heaven is relationship with God. So from the day we were placed on this planet, I'm talking about physically, to the day we go to be with Jesus, it's about our relationship with him. You grow the quality of your relationship with Jesus and you will add to the quality of your life, my friend. 100%. 100%. Now again, I'm going to challenge some thinking, right? 
I was going to say how many of you do devotions, but I don't want to embarrass you. It's all right if you are. It is perfectly all right. But can I can I give you some insight? I mean, if you're if you're new to the faith, that's perfectly all right because devotions, basically, devotions is a discipline that you have as a baby Christian. You wake up at the same time every morning. You read your word, you pray, you worship. Those, those are just the fundamentals of a newborn baby, right? But if, you're, if you know the Lord for more than 12 months, stop doing devotions. If you've got those devotional books, tear it. No, I'm just kidding. But I'm just challenging, right? I'm just challenging thinking. You know why? Here's what the Holy Spirit said to me many years ago. I used to wake up at half past three every morning every single morning uh, because my spiritual dad uh, he was known as a Smith Wigglesworth of the subcontinent powerful man and I had the great opportunity the privilege of actually living with him for three years in his own home very rare uh, but I needed that and God knew I needed that because of the background I came from right and uh, so one of the things he did the f very first morning up the, the night he said, all right, uh, you're used to waking up early. I said, yeah, at 0400 because that's the time you do, right? And 0400, so yeah, but I said, he said, I want you to wake up early. He said, I want you to wake up at 0320. I mean, great. What are we going to do? Go for a jog? He said, no. He said, at 3.30, I want you in my living room, and we're going to start praying. So you wake up 10 minutes early, go do whatever you have to do, and be there at 3.30 every single morning, seven days a week. Seven days a week. Then I moved here to Australia in the mid-80s to be with Pastor David Cartledge at Calvary, wow. and every single morning, 3.30. At 3.20, I'm up, 3.30 praying. We returned back about six years later to Sri Lanka. I taught every single one of my leaders to do that. I don't call them leaders. I'm not playing with words, but to me, they're not leaders. They're my spiritual sons and daughters. Every single morning, 3.20, wake up, pray. And so one morning I woke up and I was feeling really tired and sick, right? So I dragged myself to the living room and I had one chair for Holy Spirit. Laugh at me, but it's all right, my experience. I said, Holy Spirit, you're seated there. And I'm going to kneel down here, literally kneel down here, and I put a chair. And incredible experiences with him, powerful experiences, encounters more than experiences. But that particular morning, I'm there, and I'm tired. I'm really tired. And I heard him tell me, what are you doing? And I mean, like, duh, like what? We're like, I'm, I'm, this is honest. I heard his voice loud in here. What are you doing? And so I'm getting cranky because I'm not feeling too well, right? So the physical body, I was saying yesterday, you can't, you can't live, you know, compartmentalized. I'm going to show you that in a moment. You can't just go, this is my body, let's put that away and let's be spiritual or here's my soul. You can't live. It's like juggling. You can't juggle three parts of your being because God didn't intend, that, intend you to do that. Okay. And so here's what he said to me. He said, so do you think because you wake up every morning at 3.30 that I do what I'm doing? Listen to me carefully. I'm challenging thinking. Do you think? I'm not saying it's not important, but he asked me, do you think it's because of what you do, not the differences, what you are? You follow what I'm saying? So I'm not saying doing is bad, but doing at the risk of diminishing you being and becoming is a danger. And he said to me, go back to sleep. Three things. What are you doing? Do you think I do what you... And I'm talking about the peak of revivals, right? The height of revivals. We had planted by that time over 80 churches. Peak of revival. I was really young, and I'm saying this in context and only for the glory of God. Oh, no, I'm showing off. I was 29 years old when I was elected to be on the national executive of the Assemblies of God in Sri Lanka. 29. No pressure, no pressure. 
all of them were like generals and I was this little rookie seated there going, what the heck am I doing here? And so the favor of God and in the midst of that, that's exactly what he told me. And as I heard those words, you know what? I said to him, I said, Abba, that's all, Abba, like dad, you're my dad. You're not a general that I serve. I don't go, yes, sir, no, sir, three bags full, sir, I'm ready for mission. You're, you're Abba, you're Abba. You care for me, you care about relationship, Lord. And Lord, I, I, I put relationship with you on hold and I'm doing for you. And I'll be honest with you, I boasted about it. At every conference, they were saying, you know, here's Pastor Cammy and he's the youngest leader and my senior, I mean, all the, the, the senior people in the organization would boast about me. But when I heard that, I realized exactly what he was saying. And the learning, I'm still learning. I'm a lifelong learner, by the way. It's one of my core personal values, a lifelong learner. I'm still learning. But one of the lessons I learned then, I've never forgotten. Because the quality of my experiences is determined, is influenced, is shaped. The quality of my life is shaped by the quality of my relationship with my Lord and Savior. The second relationship is your relationship with others, your experiences with others. And that's why it's, it's, it's so important, my friend, to, you know, like Paul said, live peaceably with everyone. If you can't, shoot them. No, he didn't say that. <laughs> he didn't say that. Live peaceably with everyone. I said it yesterday, right? Pick your fights, mate. Pick your fight. You know, just because a, a dog barks at you doesn't make it any better if you bark back, right? Just walk away. Just walk away. Walk away. You know why? Because your emotional, mental, spiritual, and physical energy is drained by getting into fights that are, that are not yours. Can I say this? Don't you think that God, you know how he said to Joshua, in the book of Joshua, he sees, he sees the Lord there, the captain of hosts, and he said, you know, the battle belongs to the Lord. Not every battle belongs to the Lord. Did you hear that? In terms of human relation, not every battle belongs to the Lord. You know? So don't go start some scrap somewhere and say, God, help. You started it, you finish it, boy. <laughs> How do I know? I'm only 29 years old, but, you know. Yeah, but that's, Lord, your word. Yeah, you started it, you finish it. I'll give you grace. Next. <laughs> and so the quality of your life is determined by the quality of your relationship with Jesus and the relationship with others. Live peaceably. Back off. There's nothing to prove, my friend. Nothing to prove. When COVID hit, 2020, that's when we just stepped out of senior pastoring after 30 years because we heard very clearly the Lord saying, and this, it, it took, it's a 15-year process about stepping out to reach unreached people groups in Southern Asia, so Afghanistan and all the top area there, India, Pakistan, all those areas, right? And then COVID hit. I set up my leadership coaching business as a tent maker and yeah, couldn't travel, nothing. I couldn't get out of the house, talk about travel. And I was getting frustrated. Oh my goodness, I was getting cranky, really cranky. But I didn't stop the rituals I had, the routines I had every morning, from spiritual to my soul and my body. So for my body, I would do a workout, right? I had a gym set, a workout, and then I would do something. Some of you would have heard, it's a self-defense system, not a martial art. It's called Krav Maga. I learned it in the late 70s. Don't ask me where, because if I tell you, I'll have to... And so I do it. I taught it to my kids and, you know, so it's, a, it's, a, it's a routine, a ritual that I do. And so I'm doing my warm-ups and I heard, not Holy Spirit, right? It's me. It could be him influencing me to teach me a lesson. So here's what he said. Uh, not he, but I heard this thought. You have not done push-ups on your knuckles for a long time. Go and do some. 
And I thought to myself, ah, no. And I'm looking around because at that time our grandkids were with us. Even the grandkids are not there to call them. Look, Papa, I can't do I can you know. My wife wasn't there. She wouldn't care anyway. None of them were there. So there's no one to show off, right? But I got this strong sense within me. Keep doing it. You've got to do it. So I, you know, prepared myself. And it wasn't carpet, by the way. We had a back deck that had rough wooden flooring. It was really rough. So I'm looking at it, and my brain is saying, you're an idiot, don't do it. <laughs> but my spirit, the spirit man is going, do it, do it. <laughs> so I you know, prepared, and I started. After about the seventh one, I was crying for mommy. I should do it before, right? No, no fuss. And I make a long story short, I did 52. Wow. 52 on my knuckles. And as I'm doing that, here's what the Holy Spirit said to me. You have a strength within you that you will not tap into if you don't push yourself beyond what is. Now, there's a different story after I, I got up, I couldn't open my, my fingers, and I went to Karen, and she goes, what happened to your hands? And she goes, never mind, and she moved on. <laughs> Get the ice water, put the ice, and <laughs> it's falling in the morning. Guess what? So what the Holy Spirit told me, I said, hey, all right, 52. Let me see if I can do 62. And I did it. Till January this year, I pressed... 102 was my highest. 102. Why am I saying that? I'm saying that to say this. There's a strength that God has given us that each of these relationships, the last one, and I'll, I'll say this and, and I'll, 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 I'll tell you what, uh, the, the connection, the last relationship is your relationship with uncertainty. That's a big one. A big, 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 big one. Your relationship with uncertainty. You see, to face any challenge that comes to each of those relationships, right? God has already given us a strength. And if there's, for example, at times you feel really dry spiritually, do you think God didn't know that? He knew that you and I would be dry before we were dry. Does that make sense? And so he permits those circumstances of that spiritual dryness so that we can get up into that next level in our relationship with him. Because he knows if we are constantly staying fresh, 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 we take it for granted. So we, we begin to conform. And whatever we conform to the next level, and you know, it's, we don't have time for this, but I quickly say this, whatever you conform to makes you comfortable. Uh-huh. You talk about comfort zone, that's what it means. It's great to have Pastor Peter Holmes, a great friend of all the pastors here. He's a good man. Mwah. He's my brother. So you follow what I'm saying? And then whatever you, you, you get comfortable in, so you conform, you're comfortable, you live in the convenience of that comfort. There's a convenience, right? And it's, this is all human nature, by the way. And so that's why it's important to use any challenge that comes into that to push, to push beyond it. If it's a relational thing, for example, pushing in a relation thing is not pushing the guy or the person down, is stepping back. Just stepping back. Mate, you're right. That's perfectly all right. You're right. Move away. In your head, you can go, idiot. I'm the one who's right. You're wrong. I'm not, don't do that, don't do that, because that's not helpful, right? So you understand what I'm saying? I mean, so when it comes to uncertainty, I want you to just look at this for a moment. Uncertainty, my friend, like we said yesterday, is the one descriptive word of the world, world we live in. Uncertainty, right? I mean, you don't have to be a rocket scientist to know that. Uncertain. Tomorrow is uncertain. Now again, don't use Christianese to insulate yourself from uncertainty, okay? Don't use it. I'm not saying don't use scripture, but don't use it out of context. How many you realize just because you quote scripture, things don't just disappear? 
Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. So what do you do when it does not? When I was the principal at the IC Leadership College in Brisbane, great friend of mine, Pastor Paul Geeling. Oh, yeah, you were a student there. Uh, one of, you know, we, we had the breakthroughs and the Holy Spirit things and all that. So my, my, my topic was Pentecostal worldview. But every time I got up there, no lecture, boom, Holy Spirit. That's it. So that's Pentecostal worldview, right? So I gave them a practical. And here are the notes. Just read it. I'm not sure what Alpha Crucials will want for you to do that. That's not my... <laughs> anyway. And so during that time, several of the, you know, young leaders there came up to me and said, Pastor Cammy, like, you know, I've been praying for breakthrough on this particular thing for four years, but God's not given me a breakthrough. What do I do? One of them actually said to me, whenever I hear the word breakthrough, I run out of the building. This is true. Very serious. Now, you can use Christianese and all this stuff to tell them, but I understood exactly what they were saying. They were talking about an experience with uncertainty. I'm uncertain not about God's relationship and his love for me. I'm uncertain about his ways. Like, why? Why doesn't he do what I've asked him to do? I've fasted, I've prayed. These are true stories, by the way. Why hasn't he done anything? And so all I could tell them is, hey, you know what? You need to be able to handle the period in your life when there is no breakthrough. You've got to learn to handle that. Did you just hear what I said? You've got to handle, because no one preaches about that, do they? How do you handle unanswered prayer? Anyone of you pastors preached on that? Hmm? How do you? I mean, you're, I mean, all of us, I mean, in some form or the other, all of us have unanswered prayers. If you don't, well, start praying an impossible prayer. And so what do you do? What do you do? Spiritually, we're strong, right? I'll show that. I'm going to draw a diagram there and show you. Spiritually, we're strong. We won't backslide just because God doesn't answer our prayer. But backsliding is not the problem. How do I live in that inner core? How do I live in the area of the soul? How do I manage my thinking? How do I manage the doubts that, you know, the devil or even my own mind or people may throw at me? Family may say, hey, you believe God for a child, you still don't have a child. True stories. These are all true stories. What do you do? I have a pastor, great, I'm his spiritual son. They married 15 years. No kids. No kids. He came to a point where he said, boss, I don't want to preach anymore. I just want to go and do a secular job. I said, why? And he shared. I didn't rebuke him. I didn't give him Christianese. I understood what he was saying and I said, all right, I want to teach you something that I didn't teach you before. How to manage this part in your life. How do you do it well? How do you do it in scripture? And how do you, in spite of that, lead strong? How do you do it? So look, if you make uncertainty an enemy, it'll thrash the living daylights out of you. It'll suck the life off you. Make peace. I said again, make peace with uncertainty. Uncertainty is not the devil. Uncertainty is a human experience that is created by forces far beyond your control and mine. Even governments can't control uncertain times. They create it sometimes. I mean, look at COVID, right? I mean, the most powerful nations in the world, politically, militarily, economically, they couldn't stop the spread. And they could have, but anyway, you know what I'm saying? You, you couldn't, right? So the 11, the 11, I think it's 11, someone correct me if I'm wrong, uh, the Reserve Bank of Australia, right? The RBA, 11 consecutive interest rate, tr about to do 12. Holy Mary, mother of Joseph. You see what I'm saying? I've had young, young families come to me like desperate. Pastor Kami, what do we do? Like, what do we do? I said, well, I'll do two things. I'll pray for you. 
but I'll give you something practical. I'll teach you how to live with uncertainty. You know, the thing is this, right? It's not having more money. This is important, but get me in context. It's not having more money to pay your mortgage. That is important, important. But even to do that, you've got to preserve your sanity, mate. You've got, to be, you've got to preserve your inner being inside here. So it's not your spirit. Again, listen to me. Your spirit is strong. It's strong. It's strong. You've got, look, for the rest of your life, I'm saying that in context, you've got enough of content from Pastor Dan to be spiritually strong. I mean, step into the third heaven and all that. Live from the third heaven. You've got it. So it's not, it's not your spirit. I'm going to show you the context in a moment and I'm going to f- finish with it. You've got to manage that inner person, those thoughts, those feelings, and the power to make the right choices in uncertainty. And so if uncertainty is your enemy, your stance is different. So you're, you're in the fight mode. You want to fight it. You want to fight it. And everything within you wants to fight it. It's an enemy that you can't conquer. You can't stop. And go back to what I said earlier. What you do, if you keep fighting it, you're wasting your energy. Four energies. Your emotional, mental, spiritual, and physical energy. Because you're fighting the wrong battle. That's where prayer comes. Lord, give me the grace to walk through this. Give me the wisdom. Give me the strength, Lord. Did you, did you just see what I said? So you're using another weapon now, right? The weapon of prayer. The weapon of faith. Yesterday I spoke about, you you need to have a go-to scripture. I'm sure most of you do, but if you don't, get a go-to scripture. So for me, for many years, for many, many years, is Psalm 23. Whatever happens in my world, the first thing that my brain goes to, my mind, sorry, goes to, because I trained it that way, is the Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. That's my stance. Boom. That's my stance. So what you do is you're using scripture. The science part is this. You're using scripture to create new neural pathways that don't drag you to depression, but that activates faith. So again, the spirit. Can you see how the soul and the spirit and the body is working together? Boom. Activates faith. And it doesn't, sometimes context will change. God will perform miracles. Pastor Dan and I, I was speaking about miracles. He was sharing about some of the miracles God's done. We've all seen that, right? We've all seen the miracles. But when the Red Sea doesn't part, when I needed it parted right now, Lord, the bank is literally down my throat right now saying, if you don't pay your mortgage, we will possess your house. True stories. We're giving you 24 hours. If you don't pay it, Man, you're gone. We got the house. We understand your context. We understand all that, but we got to do what banks got to do. Because remember, they're not doing you a favor, right? They're giving you a loan. And you don't expect it. Okay. Here's, I'm going to show you something. First, let me read you a scripture. This is, this is a powerful scripture, right? If, uh, if you're feeling, you know, a bit down, uh, trying to understand what's going on in your life, here's a scripture for you. Mark chapter 4, and I'll read to you verses 35 through to 40, or 41. Most of you know it, you've heard it before. As evening came, Jesus said to his disciples, let's cross over to the other side of the lake. Just pause there for a moment. That's faith. That's what God's saying to you. That's spirit. Okay, I'll take you over to the other side. Done, right? Come on. In the midst of the greatest uncertainty, we fear no evil because your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Psalm 23. That's the assurance. So let's cross over to the other side of the lake. Done deal. Who said it? Not Santa Claus. Not my next door neighbor's goldfish. Jesus said to me, 
Let's cross over the other side. And he means it. Literally. We'll cross over to the other side. All right, so they all get in the boat. So they took Jesus in the boat. Pause for a moment. Take notice. Who was in the boat with them? So figuratively, it's like you and I having the Holy Spirit in the boat of our life, right? Because our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit. You got that? All right. So they took Jesus in the boat and started out, leaving the crowds behind, all the other boats followed. But soon, a fierce storm came up. Ha, <laughs> ha, fun. Here's where the fun starts. Isn't it crazy that we presume on God that just because we love him and he loves us and all that awesome stuff, that there, there's not going to be storms in life? One of the greatest promises Jesus gave us is this. I hate it. In this world, you will have trouble. That's a, that promise is as powerful as that one. Let's cross over to the other side. Just saying. But, as, but soon a fierce storm came up. High waves were breaking into the boat and it began to fill with water. I'm sure you can identify with that, right? I, I can. Figuratively, the uncertainty, the waves, like, you know, at times, even physically, hard to breathe. You wake up in the night like going, wow, what's going on? Not because you're a bad person, but because we live in a physical limited body. Are you understanding what I'm saying? And so the storms. So listen, Jesus being in the boat didn't prevent the storm from attacking them. Is someone listening? I don't care how spiritual you are. You cannot evade. You cannot avoid uncertain you cannot I, I please listen to me i wish i knew this when i was like two years old because i'm 29 now if i knew it but it's hindsight right hindsight but let me tell you something if i knew what i know in the past 15 years with all this stuff and i'm still learning about it perhaps i would have been a better person leave alone a better leader because i've i've, I've, I've known to understand the ways of god not just the acts of god this is the ways of God. Why did I say that? Because when you have an unrealistic spiritual expectation of God, you will be disappointed. Um, there are you know, pastors here. I'm sure you would have had this. People, some people, not all, some people leave the church because God didn't answer their prayer. I've had that happen. Even up here in Townsville. They come in because, you know, they hear us preach. And there's nothing wrong. We've got to preach it, right? But for whatever reason that's beyond my comprehension, God doesn't answer the guy's prayer. And they crank it with God, crank it with the pastor, crank it with the church, and whoosh, they're going off. Perhaps what we need to do is, yeah, Jesus saves you, he heals you, but he also gives you trouble. I don't encourage you to be preached in that form, but... Listen, listen, we got to prepare people to live in the real world they're living in. You see? And so look at verse 38. I love this. Jesus was sleeping at the back of the boat with his head on a cushion. Oh my goodness. Talk about first class travel mate. Right? He was sleeping in the back of the boat with a cushion. Now, this is amazing. He is God, right? 100% God, 100% in the man in the flesh. Yeah. Yeah? yeah? So being God, don't you think that this was a setup? Like when he said to them, hey guys, let's go to the other side. And they got in the boat. He's going, <laughs> he knew the storm was going to hit them. He knew it before they were born, by the way, literally. From eternity past, Jesus knew on that exact day on that lake with those people in the boat that there was going to be a storm. He knew. Do you think Jesus knows the uncertainty that you're walking in? Now, I want to connect spirit, soul, and body in a moment. This is a classic example of how 
it is to our detriment that we try and live compartmentalized life, spirit, compartment. So, compartment, physical experience, you can't live it that way. You can't, my friend. And some of your challenges, and not challenge, your struggle is because you try to live it compartmentalized. You can't. I have one body, I have one spirit, I have one soul, and they all need to be in alignment. My, my body and my soul need to align with my spirit. I'll show you how you, in, the, in the moment. So everything that Pastor Dan has been teaching us, right? That spirit, that is your strength. That is your foundation. That is where you live in. That is your, you know what I'm saying, right? We're all followers of Christ here. But what you need to do is, don't try to align your spirit with the soul and your body. Align your soul and your body with your spirit. So in a Christian context, and even in an external context, but I can't speak openly like I do to you, in a secular context, the emotionally fit leader or emotional fitness is simply this. You see? So, so, so see what happens. He's sleeping there, and the disciples woke him up saying what? What did they say? I'm reading from the New Living Translation. Here's what they said to him. Teacher, don't you care that we're going down? Like, duh. Didn't you guys just see the man open the blind eyes and the deaf ears and raise that guy, what's his name, from the dead and feed the 4,000, the 5,000? And like, what's going on? You know what's going on? There's an engagement of the soul here. They knew. They knew who Jesus was, right? They knew that he was the Christ, that he was Messiah. He, they knew. They knew. It's like you and I knowing that Jesus is the Lord. He's the way, the truth, and the life, and all that spiritual reality. We know. But hey, look, in the physical realm, we're exposed to the storms of uncertainty, the rough seas of uncertainty. And in that storm, our spirit is not affected, but the soul is affected. The soul is influenced by our five senses, our experiences in life. So again, when you talk about the soul, we're talking about our feelings, our thinking, our, our, our decision-making capability. Yeah? And so they go to him, and there's nothing wrong. There's nothing wrong in, in feeling that because that's exactly what they expressed to him. Lord, it, it feels like I think you don't care for us. I know it's not true, but in this context, in this storm, that's what I feel and I think, Lord. And it's perfectly all right because Jesus didn't get cranky with them. When Jesus woke up, he rebuked the wind and said to the waves, silence, silence be still, and suddenly the wind stopped and there was a great calm. Wow. That's awesome, isn't it? You know why he caused that calm? Not just to entertain them, my friend not for them to get back into their place of convenience and conform, conformation and comfort. It wasn't that. It wasn't even to give them, you know, hey, I'm God, because he already knew that. But he had an intention. What was the intention? The first verse we read, let's go over to the other side. So when God calms a storm in your life, it's not just to keep you calm and satisfied. It's so that you can continue to fulfill his eternal redemptive purposes for you on this planet. Not to keep you safe and all this stuff, which he will do, but the greater purpose is completely different. And then he said to them, why were you afraid? Don't you still have faith? The disciples were absolutely terrified. Who is this man? They asked. Even the very winds and waves obey him. I want to close with this diagram. So when Paul, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 23, he said that we are spirit, soul, and body, right? So here's what that looks like. Your inner core, my inner core, is a spirit. That's the inner core. And that's where, when Pastor Dan was teaching us all that stuff, it's feeding, it's strengthening the spirit. Listen, if you don't have strength in the spirit, so that's talking about the first relationship, our relationship with Jesus. You know, if you don't have a quality relationship with Jesus, 
that will weaken. Again, you can't take that for granted. It doesn't, nothing is automatic. All right? So you've got to input, move away from devotions, I was saying the other time, and just keep a 24-7 connection. Be totally devoted to him. Be open to the voice of Holy Spirit in your vehicle. You know this stuff, right? And so your spirit. So when he said spirit, soul, and body, this is what it means. So the spirit, and then the next circle is our soul. Remember, the soul is our feelings, our thinking, and our will. And then the outer circle is our body. So God's intention is that we don't live compartmentalized, but we live connected. Each is connected to the other. You got that? So please, if there's one thing I can tell you, and I'm not being obnoxious, you can take it or leave it. I recommend you take it. Do not, do not put your mind aside for the sake of the spirit because God needs your mind. Hello, somebody. How do you think, you, where do you actually hear the voice of Holy Spirit? Tell me, be, be real. Where do, where do you hear it? You hear it in your thinking, right? So when you say, you know, Pastor, God said, where do you hear God said? Here. It originates from here, right? Revelation is here, not here. But revelation, if it doesn't impact the mind, is useless. It's vague. You're walking in a cloud. You're driving through a cloud, a mist, right? So God is mysterious in, 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 the, in the sense that we can't fully understand him, but he reveals himself to us, yeah? Now, here's what you have to do. You've got to align your body and your soul with your spirit. Like I said a few moments ago, sorry. The arrow should go the other way. So living a life of faith means this. Everything that I think, I feel, and my decision making is influenced by the spirit, is influenced by the word, is influenced by the revelation I'm, I'm, I'm receiving from him that I then experience in my physical body in different forms and ways. If you can get that, I'll tell you what. You can go to hell and back. You get scarred, you get bruised, you will bleed, you may lose your hand, but look, you'll be a warrior. You stand up and you keep doing what God's called you to do. So, in a, I love speaking to, you know, Christian audience because I can use this stuff. And because this is true, I use it in a different sense in the secular world. In a, I use a different language, but it's the same thing. Don't tell them I said that. But the same thing, right? The same thing. Again, and I, I don't apologize because, you know, God redeems our past experiences. And for me, he redeemed whatever I did in the past. And he's given me parallels. And I go, oh, wow. Yeah, that's true in the scripture. You know, it's true in the scripture. You know, people are trained on how to operate this way in a non-spatial context. You're trained. You know, six months, 12 months, you're trained. You're trained, you're trained, you're trained. They actually re-engineer your brain. But the danger with that thing is you delete the emotions, right? You ignore and delete. That's the training. Ignore, delete, so you can finish your mission. Ignore, delete. You do it once, twice, three, four, five times. It becomes a lifestyle, a pattern, and then you come out of it and you're ignoring and deleting. You don't feel anything. But when Jesus comes into our life, he redeems it, whatever your experience has been. He redeems it. He redeems it. There's no, the scars are still there, right? But there's no pain. There's a memory. I know exactly where I got that from. I can do that, but there's no pain. I can remember, but there's no pain. You know why? Because God does not just redeem our spirit alone. He redeems everything in our soul. The way we think, the way we feel, and we process that, and the way we make decisions. And ultimately, we exchange this physical body for a body of glory. Amen? God bless.